I want to pick up very briefly with Act 1, Scene 2. Um, just to talk about a couple of things. We left off the other day, talked about Peter Quince handing out people's parts. Okay? They're going to put on a play for to help celebrate Theseus and Hippolyta's wedding. On page 1189, top of the page, Bottom asks what play they're going to produce. And Quince says, our play is the quote, is quote, the most lamentable comedy and most cruel death of Pyramus in Thisbe. What's the problem with the title of the play? The most lamentable comedy. If something is lamentable, it's what? Makes you sad. It's something you mourn over. A comedy shouldn't be something that makes you sad. It shouldn't be something you mourn over. It should be something that is joyful. It should be something that makes you feel good. Okay? So we're given right there a little introduction to what kind of production they're going to put on. All right? But very good piece of work, I assure you. He doesn't know what it is. So when he says that, he's just blowing smoke. How do we know he doesn't know what it is at all? Because Quince gives, starts giving out the parts. Bottom, yes, um, what part are you? Pyramus. You are set down for Pyramus. What is Pyramus? <coughs> a lover or a tyrant? Well, if Bottom knew anything, literally anything, about the story of Pyramus and Thisbe, he would know Pyramus is a lover, okay? He is someone so much in love with his beloved, in fact, that, as Quince says, his next line, he is a lover that kills himself most gallant for love. Sounds like what other story by Shakespeare? Romeo and Juliet, where you have two lovers, and they each kill each other for the other person. I know there's some mistaken stuff going on. The one doesn't realize the other one's dead, or that the other one isn't dead. And then when the one who was supposed to be dead but isn't dead wakes up and sees the one that now is dead, they're both dead. Okay? Bottom. So, you're going to play the part of Pyramus, a lover most gallant for love who kills himself. That will ask some tears in the true performing of it. In other words, I'm going to actually have to produce tears on my face. Moreover, if I do it, that is, the tears, let the audience look to their eyes. He's going to have them so bawling, I will move storms. I will condole in some measure. But he says, I would rather play a tyrant. And he quotes some lines about Hercules. Okay? So Quince calls Francis Flute, the bellows mender. He says, here, Peter, Quince, Flute, you must take this bee on you. What is this bee? A wandering knight? Like a knight from old works of romance who's off to slay a dragon, kill an ogre to rescue his beloved, you know? Uh, it is the lady that Pyramus must love. Nay, Faith, let me not play a woman. I have a beard coming. Okay? Two things here. I have a beard coming indicates Flint's youth. He's not even old enough to grow a beard yet. It's coming it's like there's one or two whiskers, but really nothing more. Okay? What else? In Shakespeare's day, and I, I went back through the um, introduction, I don't think it's mentioned. I mean, I just skimmed it quickly before class. In Shakespeare's day, all the roles were played by men. All the women's roles were played either by young men or boys. Boys, like the age nine at the youngest, 10, 11, 12, often early teens too, at the latest about 18, 19 years old, all right? So what you often, so what you often see in Shakespeare is a boy or young man playing the role of a woman who will then, in a play within a play, play the role of a man, or sometimes 
a boy playing the role of a woman, playing the role of a man, playing the role of a woman. Okay? And what that enables him to do is, is bring up all kinds of issues about sexual attraction, sexual identity, all that kind of stuff. Okay? So, Bottom says, oh, let me play Disby too. So, he wants, he's going to play Pyramus, the lover, and he's also going to play the beloved. That'll make some scenes a little bit awkward. Okay? So, no, you're Pyramus. Okay, right. Okay? So, he starts calling off other people. And he brings forth Snow to join her. He says, um, excuse me, Snug, the joiner. He says, you're going to play the lion's part. Have you the lion's part written? Now think about that for a minute. What kind of lines is a lion going to have? Roar. That's pretty much it. Take a lot of memorization for that one. Roar. No, not really. Okay. This is telling us something about Snug. 45 watt bulb in a 60 watt pack. I mean, he's not the brightest necessarily. Okay. Bottom. Let me do the part of the lion too. So he's been assigned pyramids. He also wants to play Thisbe. Now he also wants to play the lion. And he says he'll play the lion so well, he'll fright the women. Okay. Peter Quinn shuts him down again. Why, why do we see this happen? Why give us this little scene? It's a little bit of comic relief. Tension hasn't built up much yet, but it's a little bit of comic relief. What else? It introduces us to, wherever I put them, here, the rustics or rude mechanicals, also called clowns. I don't think you should call them clowns because they're not clowns, okay? But more specifically, it introduces us to Bottom and a bit about his character. <coughs> Okay, go to act two. We're not going to say anything else about the rest of that. Act two. Notice, now we're in the wood. So, act one is seven Athens, and it's in act one that we get the main conflict of a play introduced, and the conflict has to do with what? Okay, marriage is involved, romance is involved, um, Family hierarchy is involved, father, daughter, king, queen, all involved, okay? And then from the beginning of Act 2 through the end of Act 4, Scene 1, it's all in the wood. And then Act 4, sorry, that should be Act 4, Scene 2, to the end of Act 5. There's only one other scene in Act 4, it's Act 4, Scene 2. So you have... Act five in one scene in Act four, then conclude in Athens itself. Notice the majority of the play occurs in the wood, which is kind of governed by chaos or emblematic of chaos, nature, no law, no civilization, unreality. And this is where the fairies hold sway. All right? We're going to get to something about the fairies in a moment. So, crude drawing of a stage or a theater like the globe. You've got a picture, a cutaway picture in your book. So, here's the stage. Right? Right here. Above most of the stage, you have a ceiling. Okay? It's supported by big, massive columns. You go to Shakespeare's Globe today, uh, yeah, the columns are probably about two and a half feet in diameter, and they're a good 25 or 30 feet tall. There's a, an, actually a little lip that runs around each column. It's probably six inches wide. Yeah, probably six inches wide. It stands about this tall, okay? One of the productions of Midsummer Night's Dream there that I've seen, the guy who plays Puck jumps from the ground up onto that, repeatedly, 
I mean, a guy had to be in gymnast of some kind. Because, you know, four feet is pretty good height to get your feet off the ground. And he does it without, you know, grabbing on. Right? So, behind the stage, you have what's called the tiring house, which is where the characters come from when they enter or when they exit. They go back to there. It's where they change costumes, get a drink of water, have a beer, have a, you know, whatever. Um, depending upon the play, there may be one, there may be two or three doors leading into the tiring house. This, this whole part here, if I remember correctly, in the modern Shakespeare's Globe in London, this whole wall can be removed, all right? The stage is, your book says, you know, something like about 40 feet wide, about 25 feet. If I remember correctly, it's 42 feet wide, 24 feet deep, right? Then down here, you have what's called the yard. Groundlings, that's what they were called, paid one penny, or pence, to get standing permission here, all right? If you go to the Globe today and you buy a Groundling ticket, until at least six years ago, it was a five pounds for a ticket. You have to stand throughout the entire production. You cannot sit down. If you do sit down, one of the docents, one of the volunteers working at the Globe will come up to you and gently pick you up. And if you don't, then several docents will come and gently pick you up and take you out. And you will not be let back in. If you're standing here and it starts to rain and you pop open an umbrella, they will come up and either ask you to close the umbrella and put it down, or they will take it from you. Because you put up an umbrella and it blocks the view of everybody behind you, all right? This is packed at every production I've been to, all right? This is where the seating is. Three levels, right? Some of it's really good seating, some of it's really bad seating. Because holding up these three levels are these big, massive, uh, I think some of them are like 18 inches square timbers and you can't actually buy seats to sit literally right behind one of those. It will tell you obstructive view. Obstructive means you can't see anything. Okay? So, a fairy comes out one door and Puck comes out the other door. I don't need to mention anything else about that. So Puck says, how now, spirit? Whither wander you? It is, where are you going? And the fairy notices, notice, replies entirely in verse, in rhyme. Over hill, over dale, through bush, through rye, blah, blah, blah. And he finishes the speech with, our queen and all her elves come here anon. Okay. Puck. The king doth keep his rebels here tonight. Take heed the queen come not within his sight. He also speaks in rhyme. So what has Puck just told us? The king's coming and the queen shouldn't come here. There's something wrong between Oberon and Titania. For Oberon is passing fell in wrath, because that she as her attendant hath a lovely boy stolen from an Indian king. She ne'er had so sweet a changeling. So, Oberon is really angry because Titania has a young boy, a young Indian boy, like from the continent of India, that Puck says she stole from an Indian king. So he's the son of a king, all right? She never had so sweet a changeling. And you've got a gloss down there for a changeling, a child exchanged for another by the fairies. Shakespeare doesn't introduce this idea. This, this idea is hundreds, if not thousands of years old. It shows up in medieval literature a lot. And usually, it's kind of an explanation for why you have a bratty kid or why your kid doesn't obey you or why your kid doesn't love you or why your kid is essentially bratty, not your kid. It's somebody else's kid. Your child was switched at birth because 
My child would never behave that way. My child would love me and do whatever I wanted. Somebody else's child, however, would say, you know, whatever. In, in some of the older literature, the fairies would sneak into, or a fairy, would sneak into your home at night, take your child from its cradle, and replace it with a fairy child. A dead giveaway for a changeling? A dead giveaway for a changeling child was if the child had a hair lip. Okay. Totally unfair, right? I've got a couple of friends with hair lips, had them corrected, etc. But that was a mark of being a changeling child. So he goes on. Ogron wants the boy to be in his train, to be one of his henchmen. Titania has said no, she wants it to be in hers. Okay. So, he says, he finishes his speech, line 28 or so, 27, I think. No, 28. And now they never meet in grove or green by fountain clear or spangled starlight sheen, but they do square. And your gloss tells you quarrel. It's from that word that we get the phrase to square off. What are you doing when you square off against an opponent? You're taking a fighting stance. That's what they do. Okay? That all their elves for fear creep into acorn cups and hide them there. And Shakespeare has just told us, has just given us the first indication in English literature of the size of fairies. They can fit into a hollowed out acorn. Prior to this, fairies were our size. Elves, another word for them. Like us. Like us entirely. They could easily be mistaken for human. Okay? They have powers, obviously, that you know humans don't have. And the fairy says, I know you. Aren't you Robin Goodfellow? That's Puck's real name or full name if you want. Are not you he that frights the maidens of the villagery? Skim milk, that is, you steal the cream from the top of the milk, sometimes labor in the current, etc., etc. Aren't you the one that makes life difficult for the common ordinary villagers? Why? Puck is a prankster. Puck is a trickster. Shakespeare doesn't invent the name Puck either. Puck is related, I didn't tell this to my first class, the name Pook, also spelled P-U-K. This being goes back thousands of years. He's an ancient Indian literature. He's an ancient Russian literature and mythology. He's a trickster kind of thing. Today we would probably call Puck a poltergeist. Kind of spirit thing that just kind of, you know, wants to come in and does things like this. Takes your keys and hides them. How many of you wake up and can't find your keys? It's because there's a Puck around who has moved them. Okay. Notice, supernatural explanation for our own frailty kind of a thing. Okay. Puck says, yep, that's me. I am that merry wanderer of the night. Why of the night? When do you see elves or fairies? Only at night. You don't see them during the day. Okay? They go away at dusk. I mean, they'll, they'll uh, excuse me, they go away at dawn. They're hidden during the day and they come out at night. Okay? But he calls himself a merry wanderer. What does he mean by merry? What are you if you're merry? Happy. Happy, joyful. He doesn't say, yes, I am that malicious wanderer of the night. He doesn't intend evil by his practical jokes and pranks. All right? 
And he goes on and talks about the things that he does. As a prankster. He said, here comes Oberon. And here my mistress. They're giving us kind of directions to the audience. Wake up. Something's about to happen. Because they hear footsteps. And the footsteps are coming from in here. And then they come through the doors. So Oberon and his train, his retinue, come through one door. And Titania and her train come through the other door. Why don't they come one behind the other? Because, let's make this larger. Let's say there's only two doors. Because they're going to come off in what? Or come out in what? Square off. Kind of hard to square off when you're following. It's like, hello, turn around, you know. No. Ill met by moonlight, proud Titania. Ill met. This is not a fortunate meeting. Proud Titania. What? Jealous Oberon? Notice it's not a question. It's an assertion. Fairy skip hits. I have forsworn his bed and company. In other words, oh, he's here. No, let's go back. I have forsworn. I'm not sleeping with him, his bed, and company. And I won't even stay in the same clearing, the same forest as him. Can't say room because they don't live in rooms. They don't live in buildings. Terry rash wanton, am not I thy lord? Terry means wait. Just, just hold on before you leave. But then he calls her rash wanton. Rash. Kind of like Oedipus. Impetuous. Headstrong. Wanton. You're glad, you've got a gloss for wanton down at the bottom. Headstrong creature. Okay. That is one meaning. There is another meaning. Promiscuous. Sexually Unchaste, let's put it. Loose. She's a fun date, in other words. Am not I thy Lord? What does he mean by Lord? Come on, there's got to be at least one feminist in here. What's he mean by Lord? Master. I am your authority. I have control. That's what he means. Then I must be thy lady, she replies. And I think she replies, she should reply exactly like that. Oh, well, if you're my lord, oh, then I must be your demure little, you know. She's not Scarlet O'Hara, if you're familiar with Gone with the Wind. But I know. She knows what? When thou hast stolen away from fairyland and in the shape of corn saddle bay, playing on the pipes of corn, inversing love to amorous Philida. What? What does that have to do with anything that's been talked about? Because he called her wanton. A slut. <laughs> you could almost say what that means. And she says, and you're my Lord. But I know you do what? During the day, when the fairies aren't, you know, together, so to speak, you leave, leave what? From fairyland, be more specific before this tension between them from our bower, our bed, and you go off to the real world. And you do what? You take on the form of a country guy, country, you know, farmer, laborer. And you do what? You sing, you play pipes of corn, plays a pipe, and you verse love to amorous Philida. You try to seduce the farmer's daughter. All right? So you call me wanton? I know what you do. Why are you here? Come from the farthest step of India. Step, farthest limit of travel or perhaps steep mountain range or like the steppes of Russia high flatlands okay 
But that forsooth the bouncing Amazon, I had bouncing written up there earlier and I removed it because you know there might be too much going on there. Um, who's the bouncing Amazon that she's referring to? Hippolyta. But that forsooth, in truth, the bouncing Amazon, your buskin and mistress and your warrior love to Theseus must be wedding, or must be wedded. She's saying, I know why you're here. You're not here for the little Indian boy. You're here because your lover, Hippolyta, is getting married to Theseus. And he's not there for one last fling. He's there to bless their wedding. How canst thou thus for shame, Titania, glance at my credit with Hippolyta? My credit. What does credit mean? It's not like you have, um, you know, credit with a bank or something. Belief. Her belief in me. All right? Just as we're going to hear, Titania has had someone who believed in her, was a follower of her. All right? So Hippolyta is a follower. Theseus... Um, Oberon is trying to say, of me. You take that to be something dirty, you know, he's kind of suggesting. Knowing I know thy love to Theseus. Theseus. And he goes off and he names a bunch of names. Why? Because in Greek mythology, yes, Theseus killed the Minotaur. Woo! Good for him. He also loved and left a lot of women. Now, we could rephrase that. We could update that to the Me Too era and say he raped and left a lot of women. I am sure some of the women within the Theseus stories would probably say, yeah, it's more the latter than it was the former. To Tanya, these are the forgeries of jealousy. People who say that about Theseus or what? Jealous. They're jealous that he's that successful with women. Is kind of what she's saying. Okay? And never since the middle summer spring met we on hill and dale forest, blah, 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 blah. And I told my first class, I don't know exactly what's meant by midsummer in British usage. When does summer begin? Astronomically. According to the movement of the sun and the earth. June 21st. That's the first day of summer. When does summer end? September 21st. Because September 22nd is the first day of fall. So what should midsummer be? June 21st, September 21st, somewhere around August 1st. Something like that. But it's not, because we're going to hear later on in the play that people go out to celebrate the rites of May. Well, the rites of May are celebrated on May 1st. What? May's not even summer. And here she says, since the middle summer's spring, or since the beginning of mid-summer, so... I don't what, know exactly what that date is, but if, you know, if there, a question shows up, and it will, <laughs> on an exam, you know, when is the play set? Midsummer. That's the answer. And I can guarantee you somebody in one of my two classes is going to put winter. It happens every time I teach the, the play, even though it's right in the title, a Midsummer's Night Dream. Midsummer Night's Dream, sorry. So, what is she going on to talk about right here? Ever since they last met, what has been happening? Well, the natural world is having upheavals. There are these contagious fogs. That is, fogs that are not normal at this time of year. Rivers are rising, as shouldn't be happening. Corn is dying. Animals are giving birth to stillborn calves and other animals and such. In other words, she's saying, ever since 
we've been like this, the natural world has suffered. Why? I have to introduce this idea. This actual phrase, the great chain of being, doesn't come into existence until long after Shakespeare's death. Like, I think 60 or 70 years. The phrase doesn't exist until 60 or 70 years after, after he dies. But the idea behind it does. And the idea is that everything that is created, notice, God is not part of that. Okay? Because God's outside existence. But everything that's created exists on a chain. A chain is made up of what? Links. Okay? So when you take a chain and you hold it by the top link and you do this, what happens to the rest of the chain? It swings, right? Does it swing like this isn't swinging, is it? It's stationary. It's moving with my hand. How does the chain swing? The bottom swings a lot more than the top does. Okay? So what happens if you hold that chain and you swing it and you take a link out in the middle? Everything down below crashes and burns. Everything up here, it still moves. Why is this important? According to the great chain of being, everything that was made is connected on this great chain from the highest of the created realm to the very lowest, I don't even know what astrophysicists call these things anymore. Muons, gluons, whatever, nuons, something. Okay, so what does that mean? In the traditional Judeo-Christian sense, there are nine ranks of angels. The very lowest one, the common everyday ordinary dime store version angel is the angel, that's it. Just means messenger. The highest, seraphim and cherubim. They go, kind of go back and forth, who's the top, okay? Beneath that realm, skipping this one aside for a second, you have the human realm. In Great Britain, who's at the top of the food chain? Who's the very highest? Even higher than Parliament, the king, because the queen's dead. <laughs> she ain't nothing anymore. King Charles III. Three weeks ago, you would have said Queen Elizabeth. Okay? And notice... In this kind of ranking, he's above Parliament. It's a hierarchical structure, right? In the United States, then, who's at the top? I had one person say, Elon Musk. It's like, well, if you're talking well, he's at the top of the entire heap. <laughs> All of humanity, you know, seven billion dollars. Who's at the top here? Joe Biden. Who would be next? Harris. Kamala Harris. Who would be next? If we're going politically, you know, um, Nancy Pelosi, et cetera, but president, et cetera, okay? What is every human society, what is the fundamental unit of every human society? The family. So the family has a hierarchical structure. Who's at the top in this idea? I don't, you don't have to subscribe to this. The husband slash father then the wife, then children, etc., etc. okay? Animal realm. What's the king of beasts? Lion. Lion. I'll bet the blue whale really kind of want to go, really, you want to have a talk about that? Because I'm like 80 times bigger. Blue whale is the king of the marine beasts. The lion is king of the terrestrial beasts. What's the king of the air beasts? Is it the sparrow? Eagle. It's the eagle. That's why in Harry Potter, if you're a Harry Potter fan, Gryffindors are made of what? The actual image. Lion, king of the earth. Eagle, king of the air. All right? And we go all the way down. Vegetable, that just means plant. I don't know, redwood tree or something like that. Okay? So, what happens... 
between the human and the angelic realm, there is also the fairy breaking. Okay? Within, at least we have to say within the world of Shakespeare's play, okay, the world of that world, who's at the top? Am not I thy lord? Oberon, who's beneath Titania, and then you have all the other fairies and such. And so what have they just admitted is going on in their realm? Discord. Chaos. It's like the link is broken. And because that link is broken, because there's that discord, there's another idea rampant in Shakespeare's day called we call it this now, I don't think they actually use this terminology, the doctrine of correspondences. If something happens here, it has an effect here. If something happens in the natural world, it has an effect in the human world. If something happens in the spiritual world, it has an effect in the human world. We still see this today, kind of obliquely, in astrology, if something happens out in the stars or planets, it has an effect down here, okay? So, what's happening in the fairy realm? You have the two highest powers at loggerheads. How did the play open? Skip Theseus and Apollo for a minute. Theseus comes in. In the family, we should be like this, is like this. There's discord, there's dissent, there's dissension within the family. And that trickles down because, trick, trickles down within human society, and it's happening, partially at least, because there's discord in the fairy family, in the fairy realm. And that's having its ripple effect in the space and time of the rest of the created realm. So, her whole speech is about all the stuff that's happening in the natural world. Why? Because you and I are not getting along. That is, herself and Oberon. In fact, she finishes her speech of 117, I think. We are their parents and original. She doesn't mean like we're Adam and Eve. She means we are that which modeled them, or they are based on us, so to speak. Everything we do affects what they do. She admits that. Oberon, do you admit that it lies in you? If you're concerned about what's happening in the human realm, you can fix the problem. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? Right? What does it mean? Does it mean be cross with, be angry with? Partially. What else does it mean? It's a metaphor. How should ideal world, husband and wife, you know, two lovers, how should they go on the proverbial life's journey? Hand in hand, side by side, right? Not one in front of the other, not one behind the other, not one above the other, not one below the other. In other words, they should be walking in tandem, parallel. Why should Titania cross her Oberon? What happened at a crossroads in Oedipus the King? Somebody got killed. Why? Because those two roads weren't going side by side so Oedipus could wave at Linus as he goes by. No, they, they uh, clashed. Okay? God, all I want is the little changeling boy. Just give him to me. Set your heart at rest. And if I were directing a play version of this, I would instruct two things if we were going through rehearsals. When she says that line, she ought to pause. And Oberon ought to do something that reflects, via his facial expressions, 
She's going to relent. Set your heart at rest. Yes. She's paused. And then she says, the fairy land buys not the child of me. He thinks she's going to relent. And then she says, not even your whole land would I accept in return for this boy. His mother was a votress of my order. That is, she was devoted. She was a follower of kind of my rule of nunnery, so to speak. Okay? She prayed to me. She looked to me. And she says, and we used to sit side by side and talk. But she, being mortal of that boy, did die. She died in childbirth. Notice, here we're not told that the boy's father is a king. But Puck said that earlier. And for her sake do I rear up her boy. And for her sake I will not part with him. I'm doing this for her. Okay? She was a follower of me. What is Titania showing us? Respect deserves respect. Compassion. Oberon. How long within this wood intend you to stay? Notice he just gets very businesslike all of a sudden. I mean, down to brass tacks. Till after Theseus's wedding day. If you will patiently dance in our round and see our moonlight revels, go with us. Patiently. If you're told to be patient, what does that mean? It really means two things. One, wait. And two, tell a five-year-old, you know, to wait. You know, load a Christmas tree up with presents two weeks before Christmas. Wait. You can't touch them. Or have favorite dessert. Uh, you can't touch that till all your plate is clean. What are you really instructing that child to do? Yes, you are telling him to wait. But what else? Suffer. Because making that person wait is causing suffering, right? What's another word we use for patient? Uh, what's another context for patient? Keep going. When you're ill, you don't, be, you don't become a, what's the opposite word? For somebody who's been at the hospital and then leaves because they're well. You don't call them a well. You call them. Yeah, yeah but that's a verb. That's, we don't, I can't think of another noun. You go to the hospital because you're sick and you become a patient. Why? Because you have to patiently endure. You have to suffer until the healing is performed. She says, if you'll wait patiently, or if you will patiently dance with us, you can come with us. If not, shun me, and I will spare your haunts. That is, leave, and I won't come near you. Give me the boy, and I will go with you. Not for your fairy kingdom. She reiterates, restates, what she said about line 122. Your whole fairy land would not buy this boy. She says, not for your fairy kingdom. Fairies away. We shall chide down right if I longest. In other words, we're really going to get into it if we don't leave. So she leaves with her fairy train. Oberon, go that way. Thou shalt not from this grove till I torment thee for this injury. Ooh. That's sinister. She's going to suffer. She brought up the idea of patience. <laughs> My gentle Puck. Thou remembers, and he tells Puck about a flower. Puck says, I remember. What's the flower? Pansy. Love in idleness, as it's also called. Or your boss also tells you heart's ease. How did it get its powers? He was once watching Cupid. Cupid, remember, who is blind, shoots his arrow like Stevie Wonder, and the arrow, you know, <laughs> Lands, it lands on a flower that once was milky white and is now purple. He says, fetch me that flower. Why? What's he going to do with it? The flower has a juice. That if you sprinkle the juice in somebody's eyes, that person will immediately fall in love with the next 
living thing, person slash animal, not a tree, that he or she sees. And he says, top of 1196, I'll watch to Tanya when she is asleep and drop the liquor of it in her eyes. The next thing then she waking looks upon, be it on lion, bear, or wolf, or bull, on meddling monkey, or in busy ape, she shall pursue it with the soul of love. Notice, what things has he suggested that she will see when she wakes up? Or what kind of things? Animals. So, someone who is above the human realm in the great chain of being will fall in love with what? Not the lowest of the humans. She's going to go one whole step down. An animal. All right? He says, and before I remove the charm from her sight, I'll have this little boy from her. But he hears a noise. Who comes here? Why? Because probably people getting ready to come out are doing this on the wooden floor to announce their coming. And he says, I am invisible. Why does he say that? So that the audience knows he's invisible. First time my wife and I saw this play in London, it, they did some really cool stuff. For one thing, everybody was dressed in pajamas. Okay? But they had the same troop of actors playing the fairies as playing the humans. So the guy who portrayed Theseus also played Oberon. And the woman who played Hippolyta also played Helena. And the only way you knew the difference between the two was when they were fairies, they had a switch, like right here in their hand. Press the switch, and they had like, you know, strings of Christmas lights sewn into those pajamas. So they flick the switch, and lights come on. Not, you know, all over, but just, you know, a few lights up the arms, around the chest, the back, the legs. Just to indicate, every now and then somebody's lights wouldn't come on. And they're sitting there trying to flip the switch and it didn't work. So he says, I am invisible. I will overhear their conference. Who comes in? Who do we expect to come in? Do we expect Demetrius and Helena to come in first? No, it should be Hermia and Lysander. But Shakespeare wants to create more complication. So, Demetrius, I love thee not, pursue me not. Where is Lysander and fair Hermia? The one I'll slay, the other slayeth me. Hermia kills him, you know, because he's so in love with her. Get thee gone, he says to Helena. And she says, you draw me. You're like adamant. You're like a magnet and I'm steel. Wherever you go, I have to follow. Okay? How clearly does Demetrius make it that he doesn't love her? Do I entice you? Do I speak you fair, line 198 or so? Or rather, do I not in plainest truth tell you I do not nor I cannot love you? She says, oh, and even for that, I love you all the more. And she compares herself. Actually, take that back. She doesn't compare herself. She says she is his spaniel. His dog. Why? What are dogs always called? What's the phrase? Man's best friend. You could be... So she's a spaniel, she says. That kind of implies she is fawning over him, slobbering greatly, tail wagging like, you know, there's no tomorrow. And he's like... Go, tempt not too much the hatred of my spirit, for I am sick when I look on you. And I am sick when I don't look on you. So he's, you know, you make me ill. And she's like, oh, but I am heart sick, love sick. In Shakespeare's day, love sickness was an actual um, diagnosis for illness. It had very specific symptoms. 
not dressing properly for public, for being out in public, leaving your doublet untied, having your hose falling down your legs a little bit, okay? All, you know, not having your cuffs tied properly, okay? Why? Because you were so distracted by love for the other person, you couldn't even think to dress properly. So, Demetrius says, you impeach your modesty too much to leave the city and commit yourself into the hands of one that loves you not, to trust the opportunity of night and the ill counsel of a desert place with the rich worth of your virginity. Now that is just a long, fancy way of saying what? And it only applies to women. Do you realize where you are? You are out in the middle of a forest. Nobody's around. Nobody can hear. Nobody's going to come to you for help. Your virgin modesty is in danger. And she says, oh, your virtue is my privilege. Okay, and you've got a gloss there, I think, for privilege. Your virtue, goodness or power to attract, privilege, safeguard, warrant. I think literally it kind of means like private law. I trust your virtue implicitly, she says. Okay? He says, I'll run. And he runs off. Okay? So, Demetrius leaves. Helena leaves. Oberon steps forth. Notice he doesn't say, I am visible again. Fare thee well, nymph. Ere he do leave this grove, thou shalt fly him, and he shall seek thy love. Why? How? What's going to make Demetrius change his mind? It's kind of a trick question. He's not going to change his mind. It's, it's one of the so-called problems at the end of the play. I'm going to show how I don't think it is a problem, all right? What is Oberon already, already thinking? What has Puck gone off to get? The love potion. The love and idleness juice. Sprinkle it on somebody's eyes to fall in love with the next thing they see. What is Oberon thinking? He's going to get it, both barrels, you know, both eyes. So that when he wakes up, he's going to see Helena. And he's going to be madly in love. And she will flee from him. Okay? So, Oberon tells Puck where Titania is sleeping. He says, I'm going to go to Titania. I'm going to put it in her eyes so that when she wakes up, she's going to see an animal. You, meanwhile, take some of the juice and go find a sweet Athenian lady and an Athenian youth, distinctly youth. Put it in his eyes so that when he wakes up, he will see her. Has he given any kind of defining characteristics of the lady or youth? No, he hasn't. Okay? Just that they're Athenian. At this point in the play, how many Athenian youths and ladies are there in the wood? Just two. These two. Scene two. Titania comes in with her attendant fairies. They sink her to sleep. Okay. Oberon comes forth, sprinkles the juice in her eyes, says the lines on page 1199. He leaves. Titania is still on the stage, sleeping. An awful lot that occurs from this point on occurs with her asleep on stage. Who comes in? Lysander and Hermia. Lysander tries to get Hermia to sleep with him, not sex necessarily, at the very least sleep alongside him, and she's like, no, 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 you get, go sit over there, I'll sleep here. He says a bunch of lines, she says, you riddle prettily, in other words, yeah, I know what you're talking about, you sleep over there, I'll sleep over here. They fall asleep. Page 1200. Puck comes in. And what does he see? Athenian youth, Athenian maid, he sprinkles the juice in Lysander's eyes. 
Demetrius and Helena come in, running, talking, making a ruckus. And Lysander wakes up and sees whom? He sees Helena. So now we have Hermia in love with Lysander, Lysander in love with Helena, Demetrius in love with Hermia, Helena in love with Demetrius. None of the right people love the right people. It's all gone kablooey, you know? And Helena, we'll stop there. We'll pick up with line about 115 or so on page 1201. Um, I'm going to put up a quiz. Probably, it won't be today. Probably tomorrow, it'll be for Acts 1 through 3. Because we should get through Acts 3 on Wednesday. And it won't be due to like a week from today.